What's up, my friends? U.S. Army veteran Christopher Chaos. Make sure you like, subscribe, all that kind of fun stuff because today we're gonna be talking about how it works in today's Army for enlisted rank. And if you're someone who is new to this channel, then awesome, you should subscribe because this is the type of content that I create. But if you are someone who has watched my videos before, you are a regular here, you may realize that, hey, hasn't he covered this topic before? And you are correct. That is actually the video I created back in 2017. I wasn't even doing army stuff for this channel. I was just randomly creating things. And that happened to be one of those random things that I did several months down the road. It took off and did great. And then led me to become being just an army kind of YouTube channel. So I want to put more thought into this. I want to explain it better for you than what I did back then. So I got a PowerPoint presentation to keep everything on track, to give you some visuals and help you understand how it works for enlisted rank in the United States Army. In today's Army, how does it work? How long does it take to get promoted? What are the requirements? All that kind of fun stuff to get really in depth with how enlisted rank works in today's US Army. So we probably shouldn't waste a lot of time because there's a lot to talk about. We're going to come over to the computer. We're going to get onto this slideshow and we're going to talk about enlisted rank. Let's go. Okay, so let's dive into this. We're gonna go through some slides, kind of get you an understanding of how the rank works, some of the requirements to go from one rank to another rank and all that kind of fun stuff. So that way, hopefully you have a better understanding as far as how in today's Army enlisted rank works. So talking about some certain things that are important to understand before we dive into it, starting off with the difference between pay grade and rank. So pay grade is kind of basically just a way to determine how much a soldier is supposed to be getting paid, right? So if they are E1, you know, with this amount of time in the army, then they're supposed to get paid this much, right? And so on and so forth. So that pay grade it kind of also correlates with the rank as well. But rank is things like private, sergeant, specialist, whatever. Those kind of terminology is considered rank. There are some pay grades that have multiple ranks, and you'll see that as we kind of dive into it. But your E1s through E9s, those are your enlisted pay grades or your enlisted ranks. Some people are really sticklers on you know the terminology of that and they're like no e1 is not a rank it's a pay grade it, it doesn't really matter right we're talking about the pay grades of e1 through e9 that's enlisted those are your privates your sergeants your first sergeants all that kind of stuff those are enlisted ranks so if you're thinking about like lieutenants captains chief warrant officers those are different those are warrant officers or officers whatever the case is now from the pay grade of an e1 through an e4 that is a private to a specialist those are automatic some people don't like like to even call them promotions for that reason but it doesn't really matter for the point of this the point of this is that if you are an e1 after a certain amount of time you're automatically going to be promoted to e2 there's ways to get promoted early for all these ranks and i'll talk about those as well but e1 through e4 for those pay grades that is an automatic promotion but you can also get promoted early now Important to understand if you were to like look this up for yourself, right? To see changes or anything else like that. You may see some terminology that says like TIG or TIS. TIG is time and grade. That means that that is the requirement at that rank to be able to be qualified to move up to the next rank. And you'll see that in these examples. TIS, time and service, that is time in the army. How much time you've had in the army. So there are also requirements as far as how much is required for you to serve in the army before you're eligible for the next rank as well. In some areas, I'm gonna briefly mention a little bit about retention control point or RCP. This is essentially the maximum years that a soldier can serve at that rank because if a soldier is, let's say an E4 for X amount of years, there does come a time in, you know, in that person's career where they have to get promoted. And if they can't get promoted, then they have to do some different options for them to get out of the army because they cannot stay in the army for 20 plus years at that rank or whatever the case is. So different requirements go along with that. But I'm also gonna kind of not dive too deep into that because I've heard different kind of talks back and forth as far as if this is something that's gonna continue going on in the army or not, there's talks that it may kind of go away, it may change. So I don't really know the future of this kind of type of thing. Um, I haven't seen anything concrete yet as far as it going away just yet, but there has been talks of it. So I'll bring it up a little bit, but just understand there's usually for the most part a time limit as far as if you're gonna be in the army at this rank, you need to get promoted or you need to get out of the army. So let's move into that first rank. That is the pay grade of an E1, which is a private. You may see the abbreviation of PV1 because it's the first private because there is another private rank and we'll talk about that as well. So this one does not have an insignia. So if you see a soldier that has no rank on their chest, no rank on their sleeve for their dress uniform, whatever the case is, it's probably because they are a private. They're a brand new soldier, came fresh into the army. There's no college experience. They have nothing. They're just coming directly into the lowest possible enlisted rank they possibly can come in as. And that's what I had to do. I had to start from the very bottom and work my way up. So that is your lower ranking soldier. Five years RCP, they can't be that rank for five years and, you know, still stay in the army. So uh, kind of keep that as a note. 
but moving on from E1 as a private, moves on to E2, which is still kind of called a private. I've seen in some places where they may call it like private second class. Nobody ever calls anybody a private second class as a private. They just usually call them still a private. Uh, it just kind of depends on where you look at it. You may see some different terminology, but it's still a private, all right? It's an E2. You actually have a rank insignia now on your chest or on your sleeves or whatever. So they actually have a little bit of something to show for. So as I said earlier, you know, E1 through E4 is an automatic promotion. So automatically a soldier will get promoted to this rank after six months of being in the army. If they've been in the army for six months, then boom, automatically on their LES, which is kind of like their pay stub for being in the army, this is all of a sudden going to show that they're now an E2 and they're getting paid for E2. But that does not mean that the soldier can just simply slap on that E2 rank and start walking around as an E2. If you're in that situation where your your leadership did not promote you to E2, but you see on your LES or on your pay stub that you were getting paid for E2, you just got to bring it up through your leadership to tell them, hey, I'm already getting this rank, whatever the rank is, whether it's E2, E3, whatever, and tell them, hey, I'm already getting paid for this. Uh, we just need to go through the, the the process to actually make it official. So then they have to put in, you know, through their commander to say, hey, this soldier is already getting paid E2 get the orders cut and everything like that so we can do the proper ceremony, the proper you know promotion ceremony and everything like that and properly pin on or put on their E2 rank. You could possibly get promoted early to an E2. That early promotion could come with a waiver at four months. So if your leadership you know, sees the hard work you're doing, maybe even in basic training at OSIT or whatever, they see that you're working really hard, then maybe they might put in for a waiver to get you promoted early and then you get promoted to E2 in four months, maybe five months or whatever, in less time than it would have taken for you to just automatically get promoted to that rank. Now, also worth noting, a soldier could come into the army, you know, automatically at this rank, right? Maybe they recruited someone, you know, they referred a friend that joined the army, maybe they had a little bit of education from college or whatever the case could be, because you could still come into the army as an E2. But moving on from E2, that brings you to E3, which is a private first class. Also a rank that maybe someone could come into the army as this rank as well. You don't necessarily have to start as an E1. People that come into the army as an E3, just as a few examples, maybe like someone with an associate's degree, maybe someone who had some JROTC you know, experience from going through that program in high school, and a couple other different factors. I have a video that kind of covers a lot of different ways someone can come into the army at a higher rank rather than have to start from E1. So if you want to check that out, make sure to check that out on my channel. But let's talk about how someone can move from an E2 to now this rank as an E3 as a private first class. So a soldier who is an E2 will automatically get promoted to an E3 if they have been in the army for 12 months or a year basically, and has been an E2 for at least four months. If that soldier is doing really well and their leadership wants to put them in for a waiver to get them promoted early, they will be eligible for a waiver at six months in the army and at least two months as an E2. From here, the next pay grade we moved up to is an E4, which an E4 does have two ranks, which we'll talk about, but let's start off with the very first one of an E4, which is a specialist. People, again, could come into the Army as a specialist. I think the really only way you can kind of do that is if you have a bachelor's degree, so you decide not to go officer, but you have a bachelor's degree, so you could come into the Army and be a specialist. So let's talk about the requirements, though, if someone was moving up from an E3 to become a specialist, though. That would automatically happen if that soldier has been in the army for 24 months, which is two years, and also has been an E3 for at least six months. If that soldier is doing really well, leadership wants to put him for a waiver, that would be eligible at 18 months of being in the army with three months as being an E3. So that doesn't matter if you came in the army as an E3 and you want to go to E4 or you worked your way up, these requirements are exactly the same. So don't get it too confused. Well, what if I came in the army as an E3? Do I get to make it E4 faster or even from E4 to E5? Do I get to do it faster? No, you still have these requirements. You have that early promotion time frame and that automatic promotion time frame. But this is the last pay grade that has automatic promotions because from here on, you cannot automatically get promoted to these ranks. Now, also, you cannot just be a specialist for life. Some people, you know, like to have not a lot of leadership responsibility, not a lot of responsibility in general, and they just want to stay a specialist for their entire army career. Well, there is, does come a point in time in that soldier's career where they do have to get promoted or they have to just choose to get out of the army. For someone who is an E4, that comes at eight years. Now, if they have gone to the promotion board, then they're considered promotable. So that means that they have gone in front of a board, which is the process that I'll talk about a little bit later as far as to make it to like sergeant or staff sergeant. If they have done that process and passed the board, then 10 years. So then they have 10 years that of being in the army before they need to get promoted or they need to make a decision to go ahead and get out of the army. Now, also along with the rank of E4, there could be the potential for corporal. 
Now to get to this rank, it has the same requirements as a specialist does because it is still the pay grade of E4. It's just essentially an E4 with more responsibility than a specialist is. Because as a corporal, you're still getting that same pay that a specialist does. You just have now more responsibility, more of a leadership type of role, maybe in your platoon or whatever. So you don't get paid anything extra. So some people hate that, but some people maybe like the responsibility and the extra kind of trust that their leadership may have in them. I will say that, yes, there are some individuals that do not treat corporals the same as like a sergeant or whatever, but nonetheless, they are supposed to be treated in that same way. Now, a corporal can be promoted from a specialist to be a corporal, or they could even come from a PFC directly to a corporal. You don't have to be a specialist first and then become a corporal. You could go from PFC to corporal or from specialist to corporal. This conception I've seen a few times here and there is people think that only infantry can become corporals. So that is not true. I was not infantry. I became a corporal for a very short time period. Even recently in my civilian job teaching soldiers, I've seen corporals that were not in the infantry. So that is not the case. Basically, someone that becomes a corporal is because their leadership needs them to be in a leadership position. That basically means that, hey, we're going to put in so-and-so to be corporal. They put in for that through the commanders. They cut orders to promote them to corporal. And now they're in that leadership role as being treated like a non-commissioned officer. People that I often see in this situation are someone who maybe has already gone to the board, but you know they don't meet the other criteria to get promoted to sergeant. So they're like, hey, let's just go ahead and get that person into that role to get that experience until they can get meet the criteria and get promoted to sergeant. So kind of give them a little bit of a head start. Another thing to kind of note is let's say if you get you know promoted to corporal, you're at one unit and you go somewhere else, you go back to being a specialist. You cannot just transfer from one unit as a corporal and become a corporal another unit. It's usually like unit specific as far as being that corporal. So either you get promoted to a sergeant or if you're gonna be moved to another unit and you're still a corporal, you're gonna to have to go back to being a specialist. At that other unit, if they decide they need, need you to be in a leadership position, then they could put in for corporal again. But for the most part, that does not transfer with you if you change units. You also cannot be automatically promoted to corporal. You only get automatically promoted to specialist. And then if someone wants you to be in a leadership position, then they put in the paperwork for you to become a corporal. So next, we're going to move into the non-commissioned officers. Those are your ranks from, you know, E5 through E9. Those are your NCOs, your non-commissioned officers. But in order for you to go from an E4 to an E5 or even an E5 to an E6, you have to go in front of a promotion board. A promotion board is essentially a panel of other non-commissioned officers that are going to quiz you on army related topics, on scenarios, even current day non-commissioned officer type of promotion boards for E5 and E6 also kind of have uh, questions that are a little bit different from some old school individuals where now they're asking about soldiers in your squad asking, hey, what is Private Smith's you know, wife's name or what is Private so-and-so's child's name or those kind of things to make sure that you're on a personal level to where you know your soldiers well enough, but also you know how to do your job. So it is a combination a lot of times of just basic soldiering things, but also sometimes personal things related to soldiers in your squad. So for E5 and E6 promotions, you have to go through that promotion board, but then there's also a thing called points. So you have to make a certain point criteria based on your MOS as far as what you need to get promoted as well. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through as well, but you know, you have to make points that comes from, you know, your physical fitness tests, your weapons qualification, education, all sorts of things that accumulate to make your points. Now, from those NCO ranks, E5 through E9, they do have NCO academies. The names seem like they change like crazy, so I'm not going to dive too deep into the names of these NCO academies, but there is an NCO academy that you have to go to when you want to get promoted to E5. Criteria as far as how that works fluctuates, especially like when the Iraq War and Afghanistan War was really active, so it made it hard for people to go and attend those schools. So they usually had it to where, you know, you could get promoted still to an E5 without going to the NCO Academy. But then before you get promoted to E6, you needed to go to the NCO Academy first for the E5 before you get promoted to E6. Those definitely change with the times and everything like that. But for the most part, just understand usually before you can make it to the next NCO rank, you have to do that other NCO ranks, NCO Academy before you move on, sometimes even before you even get promoted to that NCO rank. Also, you cannot come directly into the army as a non-commissioned officer. It does not matter if you have a master's degree, a doctorate, none of that kind of stuff like that. The only people that kind of can basically come in to the army as a non-commissioned officer is if you were in another branch of service as a non-commissioned officer, for example. Maybe you were in the Marines and you were an E5 in the Marines, then sure, maybe if there's not a big break in service or you know time period between you know getting out of the Marines and coming into the army, they may allow you to come into the army as an E5. So that's kind of the only exception that you'll be able to come into the army as an NCO is if you were in another branch of service 
at that rank, then maybe it transfers over. So let's get into that ranks now, and now we're moving to an E5, which is a sergeant. So in order for you to get promoted to this, there is some you know, time criteria as well, but you know, if you meet those time criteria, then that individual is sent to a promotion board like I talked about, and then points. So you have secondary zones and primary zones, which we'll talk about, and essentially like the secondary zone is like trying to get promoted early. So usually the secondary zone, the points are higher to make it harder for you to get promoted, whereas the primary zone is a little bit lower in points to make it a little bit easier to get promoted. But those points will fluctuate based on needs of the army. So if you are in a specific MOS that has a lot of NCOs at this specific pay grade, this specific rank, then the points might be higher. That way it's harder for people to get promoted so you don't have just too many individuals at that rank in that MOS. If they are really in need of NCOs or individuals at that pay grade, then the points might be pretty low to make it a little bit easier to obtain. So that definitely fluctuates from month to month as that time that kind of changes as a monthly kind of basis. And so one month it may be high and then the next month, you know, it might drop down a little bit more to be a lot lower or whatever the case is, or may even go from low to high just based on needs of the army. So let's say you're someone in a situation that wants to try to get promoted to a sergeant as fast as possible. Well, the soonest that they will be able to send that individual to the promotion board is if they've been in the army for 16 months and they have been as an E4 for four months. At that point, they are then eligible for their leadership to recommend them to go to the promotion board. But if they immediately pass it, they can't immediately get promoted as they have a little bit of a difference as far as when you're eligible to go to the board compared to when you're actually eligible to get promoted to that rank. So if you went to that board in that earliest time frame, you still have to meet the requirement to get promoted, which is going to be at least being in the army for 18 months and then being an E4 for at least six months. Very key, especially for those individuals that want to come in the army as an E4 because they have college or whatever, you still have to meet these requirements before you can then move up to becoming a sergeant. Then you have the primary zone, which is kind of like on par when a soldier should be, you know, going to the promotion board, should be trying to get promoted to E5. Maybe they're not someone who got early promoted, but someone who is an average soldier, whatever the case is, when should they be looking at going to the board? That should come after a soldier has been in the army for about 34 months, which is almost three years, and they have been in E4 for at least six months. But again, if you're looking at that primary zone, because it does matter based on how many points you have to make, if you're trying to make points for secondary compared to primary zone, you still will not be able to get promoted to that E5 and looking at that primary zone for points until you have at least been in the army for three years and have been at an E4 for at least eight months. Now, also when we're talking about that primary zone, this is when a soldier should be going to the board. If someone is not you know, quality type of material or not someone they want to promote to E5, even though they have met the requirement for this, then usually you have to give like a calendar system, which is documentation to say that, hey, this is why we're not sending that person to the board. And that'll pretty much continue month to month until, you know, either that person gets out of the army or they do finally go to the board to say why we're not sending you to the board. And that has to kind of continue on for, you know, a, a process to make sure that that soldier knows what they need to do to improve, to get promoted, and all that kind of stuff. So that usually needs to happen around that criteria, around that time frame of when the soldier should be going to the board. And if not, they're not going to be going to the board because leadership doesn't feel that they're ready for it yet. Then they have to do some kind of written documentation to just kind of state why they don't recommend them to go to the board. Now, even when you move up to sergeant, there is a time limit as far as how long you can stay at that rank. You can't just go and make it to NCO and make it to sergeant and then stay in the army for 20 plus years and retire. The, currently, the 14 years is kind of the cap on that. So at 14 years, you either need to try to hurry up and get promoted or you're going to have to get out of the army. So from E5, we then move on to E6, which is a staff sergeant. This one also requires a board. This is actually the last one. Only E5 and E6 require a board, but same kind of thing. You have to go to the promotion board. You have to make points for primary or secondary, whichever kind of category you fall into before you can get promoted to this rank of a staff sergeant. So if you're trying to get promoted early, then an individual could be sent to the promotion board to try to make E6 as early as 46 months, which is almost four years, and they have been an E5 for at least five months. But that is to send them to the board to try to get eligible for promotion, but they still will not be able to get you know, promoted to staff sergeant until they have been at least in the army for at least four years and been an E5 for at least seven months. So now looking at the primary zone, kind of on par is when a soldier should be looking to go to the promotion board to try to make E6. They should be sent to the board after being in the army for at least six years and being E5 for at least eight months. But again, 
even if they're in the primary zone, if they've been to the board, they still cannot get promoted to E6 until they've been at least in the army for at least six years and been in E5 for 10 months. So now that ends the type of criteria for having a promotion board because that's only for E5s and E6s because now it works a little bit differently for the fallen ranks a little bit higher, which are actually your senior non-commissioned officers that we're gonna be going to. So your senior NCOs are your E7s through your E9s. They no longer have promotion boards. So they do not have to go in front of a promotion board. It works a little bit differently. They're going to be kind of submitting a packet, essentially, that has you know their history of being in the Army, what they've accomplished, what they've done, and everything like that. That gets sent up to the headquarters of the Department of the Army, or HQDA, to evaluate that individual as far as if they are ready to be promoted. There is still a requirement as far as minimum requirement to be in the Army, but not really a requirement at their rank. All right, So that does definitely kind of fluctuate a little bit uh, differently than the other ones, right? It does not no longer matter as far as how long you're at that rank, but it doesn't matter how much you've been in the army. And the basic requirements are pretty low, but I'll talk about what your average is going to be as far as what you commonly would see someone getting promoted to that rank at. So let's move into that first one of the senior non-commissioned officers, and that is the pay grade of E7, which is a sergeant first class. So someone would be eligible to make E7 after six years in the army, but that is not very common. That probably pretty rare circumstances as far as someone only being in the army for six years and making it to a sergeant first class. But your common type of time frame you would see someone getting promoted to becoming a sergeant first class is after about 10 or 15 years of being in the army. Now from sergeant first class, you then move on to E8, which is a master sergeant, but there is another rank that is associated with an E8, which we'll talk about after this. So your first initial rank of an E8 master sergeant, that is eligible after eight years of being in the army, but again, that's not very common either. Usually someone around 15 years, somewhere around that time frame, might see master sergeant around that time period, just kind of depending on what they've kind of done in their army career. But commonly I've seen people around the 15 year area or maybe higher, before they make it to E8 to become a master sergeant. But the other rank that is associated with a master sergeant is a first sergeant that is still an E8, but they are now in kind of a different criteria as far as being a lot more responsible. They are now probably in charge of a company or a troop or battery. They're that senior NCO for that level. And so that comes with a different kind of requirements to get there as well. So someone that wants to become a first sergeant, well, they have to kind of be put into that role. So they are going to have to attend the first sergeant academy. That can be done either at E7 or E8, where they attend the first sergeant academy. And, you know, if that is something that they are being recommended for to take over for that company, that troop, that battery, whatever it is, to become that first sergeant, then those are the steps they kind of go through. Because you only have one first sergeant for a company or a troop or a battery, whatever the case is. You don't have multiple first sergeants. That is basically the senior non-commissioned officer for that level, that company troop battery. They are kind of the assistant to the commander. They advise the commander on certain things, but they are mainly that senior non-commissioned officer. Now, to move on to the next rank, which we're going to talk about next, which is, you know, the E9, you don't necessarily have to become a first sergeant to move on to that one, but most commonly you are going to have that, right? It'd probably be really hard to probably make it to the next rank if you did not have some time as being a first sergeant. Because the next rank you move on to is an E9, and that one also has a couple of different ones, but first you have E9, which is a Sergeant Major. Someone could be eligible to make E9 after nine years of being in the Army, but that would be like amazing if someone was able to pull that off. Commonly, you're gonna see someone make it to Sergeant Major after they've been in for 20 plus years type of time frame to make it to Sergeant Major. These individuals work at maybe the battalion level type of thing, and they maybe are like kind of like advisors to the officers. Maybe they're the school's NCO. Maybe they are the training NCO. A lot of different roles that could be potentially at that, but usually like the battalion type of level is where they're working at, and they're kind of you know assisting officers or working in specific type of fields. But also associated with the pay grade of E9, that is then your command sergeant major. So kind of like how you had the first sergeant, it's kind of someone who is designated to be that senior NCO for a battalion level or higher because this sergeant major could be the battalion sergeant major, he's the command sergeant major, and or he's the command sergeant major for the post, he's the command sergeant major for the division, all sorts of possibilities. So more of a leadership role than your sergeant major is because he's the command sergeant major. Again, kind of similar to how the first sergeant is, you only usually have one command sergeant major. He's kind of the one senior non-commissioned officer for that level, the battalion level, the division level, the post, whatever the case is. Now there is one more enlisted rank that there is, 
that is the Sergeant Major of the Army. That is an E9S. So I've heard some people saying that Sergeant Major of the Army is an E10. No, that he's an E9S with a little, that's the special identifier. And there's only one. There's only one Sergeant Major of the Army at a time. So you have one Sergeant Major at that given moment. He is the Sergeant Major or she is the Sergeant Major of the Army. Actually, I'm not even 100% sure. I don't think they've ever had a female Sergeant Major of the Army. But nonetheless, Sergeant Major of the Army, there is only one at that given moment. When that person is ready to retire or whatever, then they retire out of the Army and someone else gets appointed to become a Sergeant Major of the Army. Those individuals that become Sergeant Major of the Army are selected specifically by the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Secretary of the Army because that's you know, a high-level type of role. So they want to make sure that someone is qualified, someone has the proper experience to be that senior non-commissioned officer of the entire Army. Be that Sergeant Major of the Army is very important. This is the most senior enlisted soldier that oversees all non-commissioned officers in the entire Army. They serve as the senior enlisted advisor and consultant to the chief of staff of the army. So a very important role. They make changes to the army sometimes to make improvements, to just modify things, whatever the case is. But it's a very important role to be that sergeant major of the army. Now, there was a lot of information that was in there. Hopefully you were able to keep track and follow along. There may be still some questions you may have and some other little tidbits here and there. that Maybe I didn't even talk about or cover or whatever. If you have comments or questions or whatever, just drop those down in the comment section down below. I'll try to do my best to maybe answer some things that maybe were not answered in this video because there might be some things that I did not answer. I mean, this video is probably already pretty long with a lot of information inside of it because it's a lengthy topic. It's very complicated and there's a lot involved to it. It's not you know as simple as this or that. If you really want to know the down and dirty as far as all the specifics, then that's what I'm trying to provide here. I mean, there, sure, there could have been a easier version of this video that's a lot shorter. I probably already, I think I already have that on my channel though. But for those of you that really wanted the deep dive into enlisted rank, that's what the intention of this was. Now, all of that information probably helps you understand what it takes to kind of get through the process to gain rank in the United States Army on the enlisted side and everything like that. I probably won't do a remake of the officer side. I have that one on here. I also have one on warrant officers as well. I want to stick to the one that I know the best, which is enlisted rank. So we'll probably stick with this one remake. I probably won't remake the whole officer one and everything else like that. But you may be curious as to what type of jobs do you do at each rank? Well, I kind of give a little bit of a summary of that. If you want to check that out, I got a video right here that you can check out that kind of explains what happens at each rank. If you want to check out one of my latest videos, I got that available right here. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for watching. Like it. Check out links down in the description. I'm Christopher Chaos, and I'll see you next time. See ya.